people have been very diligent with the various reflections, meditations, <laughs> listening attentively, putting forth effort, maintaining composure. People are practicing very well. The subjects of the last few days, body contemplation and earlier today, uh, death reflection, contemplation of impermanence, all very wonderful gamatana, meditation methods for developing insight. We do have to keep our practice balanced with practices that uplift the mind and practices which sober the mind. So the body contemplations, the awareness of death, this sober the mind. And this is important for people who think about the future too much or can't make the mind still, a lot of restlessness, or if there's a lot of sexual lust or a lot of greed. So when you're seeing the nature of the body more clearly, this uh, lust cools down and a bit of dispassion, which is very helpful. Of course, later in insight, in the process of developing insight, these gamatanas deepen and actually liberate the mind, as we know from reading part of Ajahn Nan's biography and part of Michi Gao's biography. It was while doing body contemplation that they had profound mind-changing experiences. They did also mention that they felt disenchanted, dispassionate, uh, sad. So that's part of the process. Tanajan Anan in particular mentioned that he also loved cultivating the Brahma Viharas at the same time and probably had them to the had developed them to the point of being able to absorb on the jhanic level. So Tanajan was balancing his body contemplations with very blissful, sublime uh, states. So there's a few practices we can do to and keep things balanced because a bright mind with well-being is the best foundation for insight and so we have to know when it's right to calm things down and sober the mind. We also need to know when it's right to buoy the mind up, remember to have a light touch. And So the metta practice, obviously very uplifting, nourishing. Buddha Nusati so if we actually recollect the qualities of the Buddha, this can give rise to a lot of joy. If we open our heart with appreciation, just imagining this uh, being who could teach people perfectly according to their dispositions, and he would walk great distances to teach one person such incredible compassion and uh, liberating many thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of humans in northern India in his 45 years of teaching. So we think of the Buddha's beautiful qualities and incredible example. They say impeccable in conduct and understanding. Not just perfect in appearance, thinking about the inner qualities, it says that his heart quivered with compassion for all beings. So that that's what gives him that in a personable beauty, really lovely quality. So someone who is not just having that scientific precision, that, that intellectual mastery, but a heart that uh, sees everybody like children who he wants to liberate, uh, remove from all fear and danger. So when we contemplate qualities of the Buddha like that, also very uplifting. Another practice not talked about so much is the Devanusati. It's another of the Anusatis. So the way it's described in Visuddhimagga is you just recollect the qualities of devas. So devas are renowned for having patience, they forgive, uh, having loving kindness, and particularly having restraint. Hiri and Otapa is what they're praised for having, which is a sense of conscience and a sense of a uh, wholesome sense of shame. So it's obviously not all devas, but uh, it's generally talked about the qualities of devas. They have a high level of conscience and uh, a lot of metta and a lot of patience, which was the cause for their being born in the heaven realm. So how it's taught is one thinks of the devas in different realms and their qualities. So the higher you go, the more radiant, the more illustrious, the more 
beautiful, the Deva's qualities and minds up to the Brahma realms. But sometimes just hearing stories which allude to the existence of Devas, it does, it does brighten the mind. It is interesting and uplifting, depending on one's character. Uh, my character enjoys these kinds of stories. And uh, so I thought I might share a few little experiences. When I was uh, five years as a monk, it's a little bit of a tradition in Thailand because for the first five years you are under dependence of a teacher and you can't go anywhere without their permission and their agreeing. After five years you have freedom to make some of your own choices and so many of the monks go on Tudong, wandering around for a while, visiting other teachers and celebrating their hard-earned freedom in a way and uh, enjoying the wide open road and the expansive horizons because after, after five years of having to be in the morning chanting, having to be at chores time, having to do this, having to do that, have, have, have to, have to, have to. It's a uh, very good training, but naturally young men long for a little freedom at times. So I wandered off after my fifth range retreat alone just to explore some of these practices. Tudong is an abbreviation of the word Dutanga. And the Dutanga practices are for shaking off kilesa. They're forms of austerity practices. So walking on Tudong is part of this tradition. But there's also staying in wild places, staying in orchards, staying in the open field under the sky, various practices that you do to expose oneself to a little bit more vulnerability and practice more renunciation and practice with fear. So I was doing that, I was uh, wandering and sometimes staying in fields and it was uh, rice had been harvested so you could come across these big piles of hay in the rice field and you could set up a little mat and uh, not so many mosquitoes in the cold season and you could sleep under the stars in the field and I would wander and I would come close to a village and so I would stop. The next morning I would pack up my things, I would walk arms round with my things on my back, two bags balanced, with the arms bowl out the front, and uh, then get usually get some food. Northeast Thailand, uh, most towns in Northeast Thailand have monasteries and there's a certain time that monks will go on arms round, so often would get quite well fed and then have the meal at the other side of the, of the town. But I remember it was more difficult than I thought and in, in ways that I hadn't realized because it's very hot, even though it was a cold season, there's not, many, there's not much forest left and Thailand is largely deforested. There are some national parks, but there wasn't much forest left and there was a lot of litter along the side of the road as well and so there was this sense of, of wanting to be a forest monk wandering and, and here you are in the baking sun and, and there's all this rubbish around your feet and... And then naturally you get uh, hot and you get thirsty and there's all these trucks with Pepsi driving past delivering, <laughs> delivering Pepsi to because Thais drink a lot of soft drink. And so it was very interesting because you wanting to be with Buddha as you walked, Buddha, 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 but then the Pepsi truck would go past, Pepsi, <laughs> Pepsi, <laughs> Pepsi. <laughs> There were a notable number of occasions where I thought, hmm, I want a Pepsi. And within not very long, a car would stop and somebody would hand me a Pepsi. And so that was very interesting. But more interesting than this was there was one day where you get a bit fed up with your desires because you can't fulfill most of them and there's a lot of blisters, sunburn, sweat chafed skin, uh, smelly clothes. There's a lot of unpleasant things to work with. And I was being almost facetious one day, I was walking into one village and I was thinking, I was kind of playing with my kilesas as well. And I was like, well, do I want to sleep in a field or do I want to sleep in a forest or do I want to sleep in a monastery? And I was like, no, I, don't, I want to sleep in a shelter in a field uh, with a hard wooden floor. And then I'm like, mm, do I want Pepsi? No, I actually want Fanta. <laughs> Which is it's pretty stupid, but anyway. Uh, this man appears as I'm wandering into the village, and he says, I would like to invite you to come and live in my little shelter in the field. 
and he took my bags and he said, I'll help carry your bags. And then he told his son, he called over his, over his shoulder, he said, buy the monk some Fanta. <laughs> and so this son of this man came on his motorbike to this wooden floored shelter in the field with one liter of Fanta. <laughs> so you see these things occasionally and I say, oh, now that's interesting. And I think, I think what's happening is uh, it's hard work and one is, one is trying quite hard. So those devas who, Buddhist devas, who rejoice in monks trying, possibly listening in, and even though the desire is pure kilesa, really, I want to sleep in this shelter and I want this kind of sweet drink, and are well, they thinking possibly, okay, well, we'll encourage him. But another thing happened on this, this uh, trip. I was staying in Dhammayut monasteries. Dhammayut's a uh, different kind of a lineage, Lumpur Man was in that lineage and Ajahn Mahabua. Ajahn Chah was a little unusual in that he banned smoking in his monastery a long time before other monasteries did. And see, Lumpur Man smoked and so did Lumpur Cha. And so I think the devas of Thailand might not have a, a condescending view towards smoking because uh, they'd seen the Kru Rajan smoking. And so I would stop in at these Dhammayu monasteries and there wasn't much by way of a cup of tea or a decent cup of coffee, but they, they all had these cigarettes. They all had tobacco, roll your own tobacco. And so I thought I'll try one. And so I tried one and okay, it was better than nothing. And then you'd wander another few days and you're in another Dhammayut monastery and there's more cigarettes and everyone's smoking. And it's kind of funny because before the evening chanting they have their smoke and after the evening chanting they have their smoke. And, and so I started to smoke, first time in my life, never smoked before I was a monk. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't smoke anymore, I don't smoke now either. But during this time, it, I was, uh, you know, out and about, exploring freedom. And so I had one cigarette, one monk gave me this cigarette, which is called a Krong Tip, which means a Davis rib, that's the brand name. And it's probably the equivalent of a Winfield Red or a Marlboro Red. And so I, I had this cigarette, it was so strong I, I couldn't walk. I sit down feeling dizzy, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. But then on another occasion I tried a different brand which was called Siphon, which meant falling rain. Now falling rain cigarettes are a mild menthol. And it turned out that I quite liked that one. And so, but I realized, I was walking all together for about two months, and I realized, you know what, you're getting a bit addicted to this. Whereas before, because they give you some tobacco when you're leaving the monastery, okay, take some, there's a lot. And so you're wandering in the heat, and it's uh, a little bit hungry, a little bit tired, a little bit thirsty, a little bit sore. And it's like, hmm, I might have a cigarette. And then you have the cigarette, and you notice that you feel a bit better. And then so I noticed that I was starting to have a cigarette instead of, whereas before I might go under a tree and meditate, I was thinking, I'll have a cigarette. I thought, this is not, this looks like not a good direction to be going. And so I gave up. I, only, I think I only smoked for about two weeks, but then I gave up. But then what was interesting was a couple of days later, I was thinking, well, I know I've given up, but I just want one. I want one of those falling rain menthol cigarettes. And so I turned the corner, I think I crossed the road and I turned the corner and I'm not joking, there was one perfectly clean, falling rain, menthol cigarette before my feet. <laughs> and uh, that's interesting, how did that get there? Now what's interesting about this is, weeks later, when I was walking up a mountain behind Chiang Mai to go and pay respects at some relics in Doi Sutet Monastery, a very famous monastery, the same thing happened, I was walking pre-dawn and it was weeks since, since the previous cigarette. And I was walking up the hill and uh, I had the same thought. I thought, oh, it's actually quite steep and quite long and on an empty stomach. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe a cigarette would be good. And so I turned the corner and once again, a falling rain menthol cigarette in perfect condition right in front of my feet. So isn't that interesting? <laughs> I don't even know how they do it, but it's interesting. With regards practicing in Bogaya, I've experienced some interesting things with this phenomena of Bodhi leaves. 
Now, many people who go to the holy sites want some souvenirs to recollect the uh, joyful, happy occasion. And, but there's certain seasons where hardly anybody leaves fall. So, November, December, January, there's not many leaves falling in the cold season. Come late February, March, many more, but uh, in that time, they're not falling, or very occasionally. But I remember I was there at that time, and I was, uh, like everyone else, I wanted some body leaves. And uh, there was one morning, I'd made some vow, I was trying to sit, at that time, I think it was a hundred hours, I can't remember within what time frame, but I was trying to do a hundred hours of meditation during my period of practice there, and I had to be at the tree uh, fairly early, and I had to be consistently there morning, afternoon, evening. And so I remember one one morning, I'd been to Vulture's Peak the day before, and I got a bit of a sunstroke, actually. And I went to the Bodhi tree, and I was meditating, and I was thinking, I felt quite sick. And I was thinking, oh, you should go back and sleep. This isn't working. And uh, then I had this thought, no, I didn't come just to have peaceful meditation. I actually came to develop more determination, more consistency. So just sitting here with that intention, under the Bodhi tree, being determined to fulfill a vow, to increase my capacities, to be more determined, more patient, more consistent, that's, that's what I should be doing. And at that moment, a Bodhi leaf landed in my right palm. And there was this sense of, oh, that's interesting. It felt to me like a deva might have been saying, that's right, Achalo, you should be consistent and, mm -hmm. and determined and just practice, even if it's peaceful or not. So uh, that was a nice occasion. Recently, uh, something happened a couple of times. I was going early in the morning, and uh, one of the first under the Bodhi tree, the different types of Bodhi leaves in different seasons. So if, if a leaf falls in the cold season, it's usually quite shriveled up. And Tanajananan has said that each Bodhi leaf does have some special energy in it because that Bodhi tree is on the very site where Lord Buddha was enlightened. So there is a very special energy and the tree does have a special energy. Some of these uh, very gifted monks who have divine eye can look at a Bodhi leaf and know if it's from that tree, does have uh, particular qualities. But I put my monk's bag down and I went to offer some flowers. And I, I came back and I put my hand in my, in my bag to get a few things, earplugs and insect repellent. And there was this very large, perfectly flat, perfectly smooth, green Bodhi leaf in the bag. And I'm like, wow. And uh, I did my three-hour early morning session, and by that time the leaf was beginning to shrivel a little. And it was like, I was thinking, did that fall in the day before? Where did that come from? But it really must have fell in those few seconds when I was offering flowers before I came back. And it, it was really encouraging, the sense of, okay, a beautiful, green, perfectly flat one in, in the bag. And that was uh, interesting. What happened most recently, I think, is related to another student's good karma, her, her merit, or her good intentions. So there's a, recently the monastery found out that the land next door was going to be sold and they were going to build a resort on the land about well, adjoining the women's section. And resorts in Thailand, unfortunately, often have this uh, karaoke phenomena. And and then listening to drunk people singing every Friday and Saturday night is not much fun. And so, although I didn't really want the burden of having more land to take care of, uh, I don't want a resort right next to the monastery. And so I was talking to some committee people and we decided that we, we had to try and get it. We spoke to the lady and she agreed to halve the price of what she was going to sell it because she is Buddhist and she gave us a year. Now this student from, from Bangkok, she decided that she would help one third of the cost. It's quite a bit of money. And so she, she said, when should I offer it? And I said, well, offer it under the Bodhi tree when we make a nice ceremony. This wasn't when I was leading the pilgrimage. This was when I was there for a month of private practice. I was doing, I was trying to do 300 hours in 33 days of meditation. 
dedicating that to my father. And so she came and some other people had an attendant there as well, another monk from the monastery, two other monks from the monastery. So it's a small group of, of uh, monks and close students. She came for a week and she was also meditating, I believe, seven hours a day for seven days, 49 hours. She'd made that vow. She said, when should I make the offering? I said, last thing in the evening when we've completed our quota. And so we were packing up our mats at 8.40. It closes at 9 and they start blowing whistles quite aggressively at 8.45. So I said to her, her name is Jintana, I said, Yom Jin, I don't want you to offer it to me. Since we're at this holy place which represents the seat of enlightenment of Buddhas, I'd like you to invite the, the merit or the barami of the Buddha, in fact all Buddhas, past, present and future. And then I'd like you to invite the devas of the Bodhi tree to rejoice. And I'd like, so I led her in a little ceremony where she, we did the namutasa, and then she repeated after me, I offer this land for the sake of protecting a practice monastery and for the sake of increasing the lifespan of the Buddha sasana in this world. May the Buddhas please receive this offering and may the devas rejoice. Now, a very interesting thing happened. It's literally closing time by this time. Just after I gave the blessing, transferring the merit, dedicating the merit, so she wrote the amount that she was going to offer within which time frame, and then she offered that. That was her making her pledge. And then literally picking up our bags to leave, and this gust of wind, a very, very strong gust of wind with no rain, blew at that moment, and I'm not kidding, hundreds of Bodhi leaves fell. And so we were running around giggling with delight. <laughs> and at the end of a long day of striving, and we pick up handfuls, and we're trying to find plastic bags to put them in. Now as soon as that gust died down, another one came. And then we were running around picking up, we actually started to get fussy, we were picking up the, the nice green big ones and not going for the little ones. And there was only about 20 people left, and usually there's many hundreds of people. There's about 20 people left, and even the guards, they weren't chasing us around, they were chasing us out, they were enjoying the spectacle of these people running around laughing joyfully with their treasure. So that went on for about 10 minutes, and we all got at least 100 Bodhi leaves. This is... For the Thai Buddhists, this is serious treasure. This is, uh, everybody wants a Bodhi leaf from the Bodhi tree. So it's wonderful because now I can give them away to my students in Thailand. But I did have the sense that had never happened before and the timing was extraordinary. And it did seem as though uh, the devas of the Bodhi tree or the other devas facilitated something and uh, we all got a hundred Bodhi leaves. Uh, but it was a very sincere and generous offering, and we did ask for the devas to rejoice. So there was, uh, I just like to tell these stories which seem to indicate that some of these subtle-bodied non-humans do listen in and uh, are perhaps capable of rejoicing. Well, I think they are. And so I just like to tell some stories that uh, suggest that. Other stories, since I'm telling stories, <laughs> One, a few things happened in my monk's life which made me have no doubt that certain gifted monks have mind-reading abilities. So this comes into our Sangha Nusati, the special qualities of Sangha. So, would you like to hear these stories or not? Yes! <laughs> when I was staying with Tanajananan, uh, it was my second range retreat, and I went to stay with Tanajan. And uh, that's another interesting, I'll tell you that story too. I was, uh, because I was rich with suffering as a young monk, and uh, I had good teachers, Tanajan Jaya Saro gives very good Dhamma talks, and uh, Ajahn Pasano, I'd been his attendant before he went to America, but I felt something was lacking, and I'm not criticizing them, I'm, more, I'm saying more that given the extent of my struggle, I needed extra special help. That's how I felt. And so I actually went to the Emerald Buddha, uh, the statue of the Emerald Buddha in Bangkok, before a period of intensive practice in the jungle. 
And so I paid respects and I'd heard that making vows at the Emerald Buddha is quite effective. But it's also said that if you make a vow at the Emerald Buddha, you better keep it. Because if you don't keep it, uh, apparently devas can also punish. So the vow I made was simply, I want to be a monk for a long time and I want to be a good monk, but I feel I need a teacher to uh, help me with my challenges. And if there is a teacher that I have an auspicious karmic connection with in Thailand, may I meet that teacher. And so I made that vow and then I went into a remote monastery called Dao Dam, which means black turtle. And it's a hermitage of Wat Nana Charts. It's on the border of Burma in a large space of jungle. Ajahn Pavro, I believe, spent six months there. I've been there uh, seven times, usually for a two or three month period. And uh, so this, this was my second time going there. And I was going in before the group from Wat Nanacha. The group from Wat Nanacha, 15 or 20 monks, will go for March and April most years. But we went in in February for an extra month. And so it was curious that during that month, I think there were only four monks there, Western monks. Ajahn Kalyanu was one of them. Ajahn Anan decided to come with, I think, four or five of his monks from Wat Map Chan in Rayong. And so I actually met Ajahn Anan, curiously enough, in a jungle in the middle of nowhere. And it's interesting to note that that hermitage doesn't even have a village. There's no town there. They have to ship food in and they have Burmese cook making food. So it was an unlikely occurrence. It was also the only time that Tanajan went into the jungle there. And I did have the opportunity to meet him and I had that very helpful conversation which I've relayed to you before about the experience I had and Tanajan and saying yes. In the beginning it's like you're in this house that's on fire and your mind gets more sensitive and you're aware of dukkha but you don't have anywhere to rest yet. And as you practice patient endurance, you develop this cool place where you can rest. He says, the house is on fire, and uh, it is an accurate perception, but the mind doesn't yet have a space to rest. But through patiently enduring, it will develop. And so that piece of advice and that bit of empathy and that perspective at that point in time was extremely helpful. I'm not sure if I would have made it much longer had I not met him. And so then I asked him, am I trainable Ajahn? Because I was losing confidence in myself and he looked at me and he says, you have merit, Ajahn, he said. Uh, and that was so helpful at that time because <laughs> I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like I had merit. And then I said, so can I come and practice with you? And he says, you may, you may come and practice with me. So that was when I went to that, went to stay at Ajahn's monastery for my second rains retreat having had the very good fortune to meet him there in the jungle. And so, is that interesting? Making a vow at the Emerald Buddha, and then uh, that occurred. Mm -hmm. Then, the thing that made me confident that Tanajan may have special abilities is, uh, there were many occasions actually. I think he really, he went out of his way to be encouraging during that time, because uh, it was obvious that I needed encouragement. So. There was a, an out-of-season cold snap and uh, Thai people feel the cold very acutely because they're accustomed to 30 degree, 35 degree temperatures. So I don't know, I think it went down to 20 and everybody turned, everybody turned blue. <laughs> but it sounds funny, but their skin actually goes dry and starts to crack when it's 20 degrees. I mean, because they're so used to 30, 35 and uh, their teeth literally chatter. It's quite funny. And um, now that I live there, I'm a little bit similar actually, so I don't laugh quite as much. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, so somebody gave Tanajan a, like a box of baby oil. And he was handing it out to, to the monks to rub on their dry, chafing skin. Now, ever since childhood, I've had this, I don't know what it is, but I don't like greasy feelings. I don't know why, but I don't like greasy feelings. And so I've never used, uh, I've never used baby oil before. In those days, there was only about 15 monks, so it was this very family-like feeling. And uh, we used to have tea in front of Ajahn's kuti. And so he would come out and chat occasionally, or just come out and walk around. 
And so on this day he came out and he was handing uh, baby oil, small bottles. And he walked towards me with the baby oil and I thought, I don't like greasy feelings. Yeah. And he stopped. And he turned his back and he went back inside his kuti. I felt terrible. Mm -hmm. I felt, oh, you're getting a gift from an enlightened being and you're going to be fussy? What are you thinking? And I was giving myself a hard time. Now the next time, the next day at tea, Ajahnan called me into the office. He said, Ajahnan, come in the office. And I came in the office and he handed me a little bottle of moisturizer with vitamin E. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> So there were some, <laughs> that was I think his way of saying, uh, I'm paying attention <laughs> and uh, it's okay that you don't like greasy things and he's not judging me. <laughs> I gave myself a really hard time when I, when I thought that I don't want it and he turned around and, and uh, there was another occasion I can tell you. Are you bored yet? No. no. Okay, just let me know if you're bored. So. <laughs> there are a few other occasions where, uh, sweet occasions where one day, I used to get irritated be because we had to do the chores together in those days. Now they've broken it up in little teams, but in those days everybody would meet, except for the team that was cleaning Ajahn and Kuti, but everyone would meet and clean one of the halls upstairs. And there were all these different cloths with Thai language on it. You had to use the cloth for the floor, the cloth for the wall, the cloth for the furniture, the cloth for the Buddha, the cloth for the shrine, and I couldn't read Thai. And uh, it used to drive me crazy. And I said, which cloth is this? And, and the monks didn't want to explain it every day. And I, I was trying to learn, but it wasn't that easy. And I was actually the only, I think Kalyana was there. He wasn't coming out for chores because he was studying for the Abhidhamma. And he, if, I, if I understand correctly, he actually came first in the country that year, mm. in Thailand. So he wasn't out to help say which cloth was what. He was studying Abhidhamma, Satu. But uh, I used to get a bit frustrated. The other thing I get frustrated about, because after we clean that hall, we have to go and clean the eating hall down, down below. And then we'd all sweep leaves. And uh, Thais kind of like doing things in groups, but Westerners prefer a bit of personal space. And we also like things to make sense. It just didn't seem to make sense to all do it together, because it took a long time. It was taking like nearly two hours. And uh, you're a young, idealistic monk. You want to have time to meditate. This is a waste of time. And uh, if we broke it up, it'd all be over in half an hour, blah, blah, blah. And so I'd think those thoughts, well, often. And the thing that really used to bug me was when we sweep the leaves, we would sweep them so there were none left. And uh, it's a bit absurd because it's a, it's a forest and leaves are always falling. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you finish and you turn around, there's more leaves falling. So I just, I just had this sense of, can't we sweep most of them? Can't we just sweep a bit more quickly and just leave a few? Because it really took a lot longer to sweep till there were no leaves. And, uh, but anyway, I remember I was thinking these angry thoughts about how stupid it all was one day as a young monk. And uh, all of a sudden, my mind and my body just felt light, joyful, empty. The thoughts fell away, the feelings in the heart fell away. And this involuntary smile was on my face. And I'm like, wow. And I turned around and I saw Ajahn Anand walking in the distance. And I went later on, I asked him, Paul, did you do something when I was sweeping leaves? And he did this interesting body language thing. He said he knocked the mind state out of my mind with his metta. Now this was a very valuable occasion because we identify with our mind states. We think it's ours. If it really is ours, how can another person knock it out of your mind? It's an interesting contemplation, isn't it? And he said, I just wanted you to see what it's like to not have that type of suffering as an encouragement. Uh, well, thank you very much. Could you do it every day, please? <laughs> He's like, no. It was an encouragement. But you have to, now you have to get back to work. Now, I have another similar story, this time with the Dalai Lama. This, is, this was very interesting. Would you like to hear a story about the Dalai Lama? Yes. <laughs> so, I came to the Dalai Lama's teachings in Melbourne, actually, many years ago, when he taught at the Rod Lever Arena, 
and I actually, I was visiting, I came to visit my parents, and we came to this teachings, a close student from Thailand, a French man, came with me and was my attendant. So we turned up at these teachings, this was before I was staying at Warburton, I think I had uh, ten, ten reigns retreats, nine years ago. So we went to the Rod Laver Arena, and I got my seat allocation, which was on the stage, and it was in the front row on the stage. I was in the front row on the stage closest to the audience, and it was about seven meters from his holiness seat. And I was the only Theravadan monk, and so I felt a little bit self-conscious. But anyway, I sat down, and then this guy comes up to me and he says, Can you chant the Mangala Sutta? I said, Yes, I can, but I'm not going to. <laughs> And he said, yes, you are. His Holiness has requested that somebody chant the Mangala Sutta. I'm like, I'm not. He said, yeah, you are. And he went away, and he left the microphone there. And by that stage, I think it was, about, well, maybe at least 7,000 people attending that, that teaching at that time. So His Holiness came on the stage and got to shake his hand. That was nice. And uh, so he's giving his introduction, and he's saying his usual very gracious diplomatic introduction talk about he doesn't recommend that people change their religion he under he recommends that people study their religion and then if if people really want to they can become buddhists but he's not trying to convert people and people should understand their own faith first and so he gave his very gracious talk and he's being very careful and then all of a sudden he says so who's chanting the mangala sutta he says okay you in front of 7,000 people. And so another microphone arrives, there's two now, and I see the camera as well. And I'm like, oh God. Now, in the old days, if I, if I had to talk, when I was a young monk, if I had to talk to more than 10 people, my voice would shake with shyness. It would quiver. I was very shy and uh, self-conscious. And I, I had this choice I had to make. It was like, Either I embarrass myself and let down the team by saying, Dalai Lama, I'm not doing this, I'm too nervous. Or I try, and I do it as an offering to him. And so I thought, oh God, I have to try. And so I, I start to do that, but I'm very nervous. And I, more than half of me doesn't want to do it. So this is where I feel that I experience the psychic power of the Dalai Lama, because just in setting the intention, okay, I'm doing this as an offering to you, Your Holiness, because I really respect your practice and your example. And so I start with the Namo Tassa, and very kindly His Holiness joins in. So I'm chanting Namo Tassa with the Dalai Lama. Very nice. And I start with the Asevana Chabalana. When I start, ah, uh, that feeling of being Achalo, the, the guy that I'm quite familiar with, is just isn't there. And all that is there is the awareness of the next syllable. And I feel that he, because we've been talking about this, the self-view is a habitual way of perceiving things which isn't the truth. And it's based on the fact that we're grasping the body and grasping the feelings of being a self. Now, His Holiness is always talking about emptiness, how to contemplate emptiness and various realizations into emptiness. And so I think that with his, the power of his mind, he just pushed Achalo's self-view out of the mind-body experience. So that all that was there, and I chanted this Mangala Sutta perfectly with this strong, clear voice, and then finished the last syllable, and then that feeling of being me came back, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> and he's like, his holiness is like, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, so people came and asked me, oh, really good chanting, yeah, that was great. Yeah, what was it like to chant the Dalai Lama? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I wasn't there. And, uh, but that was a very interesting experience. And then, so the next time I attended His Holiness teaching, so I think it was in Sydney, then I was like, it'll be fine. But what's interesting about that experience is, if I had known that I had to chant the Mangala Sutta on stage, in the front row, in front of 7,000 people, alone, I would not have got out of bed that day. <laughs> it's interesting to see what, what is possible when at least you have the pure intention and you have the 
faith and uh, you want to want to serve the Sangha and be a good example. So uh, it turned out okay. And he did something funny in Sydney, which really, that was a bit rattling actually. Next time I chanted in Sydney, he said, okay, Mangala Sutta to me. And uh, so I started to chant, the mic's about there, and I started to chant, and I got two verses in and he said, stop. I'm like, what? <laughs> he said, your voice good, microphone closer. <laughs> he made me start again. And in that moment, I wasn't there like before, but then all of a sudden I was. I, I was back again, and my mouth went completely dry. <laughs> and so I had it one second, one second, I had to drink some water and oh, start again. So, anyway. <laughs> you do his voice well. I've listened to his voice for many hours. So. <laughs> there was another there was another occasion with a Dalai Lama. Shall I tell you or not? Yes. yes. Okay. I went to India. I do have a I believe strong karmic connection with India. So I actually went after my eighth rainy season retreat and I visited his Holiness Dalai Lama was teaching a nine day teaching in one of the monastic universities in southern India. So I went with a good friend and uh, we were attending that teaching. And I asked Ajahn Anand what would be a suitable gift for the Dalai Lama and uh, he gave me some relics. And so I thought, wow, some Buddha relics to give to the Dalai Lama. Now the Dalai Lama was teaching, I think it was about 15,000 monks at this teaching occasion. And uh, it's the biggest monastic university and he had a lot of meetings and a lot of teachings. And I asked his secretary, I've got this special gift that I want to give him. And he says, no, there's just no time. And I said, look, all I, all I ask is for permission to be along the side of the road that he has to walk by and to just give it to him. And, uh, and he said, okay, let me see what I can do. So he told me the Dalai Lama was receiving guests very briefly after teaching and before a meeting. And so I was... Uh, I was at the end of the line and there was this long row of Tibetans who'd actually traveled all the way from Tibet, especially to... Oh, and this is very interesting. I'll tell you that too. So, uh, <laughs> you see, if I get in, this, in the mood, there's lots of stories. So, I was at the end of this line and then some of these Tibetans had obviously saved up a lot of money for a long time and they just want to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama once in their life and they've come all the way to southern India and uh, they smelt awful because it was summer in India and they'd come all the way from Tibet where, and they were wearing thick clothes but anyway that's not, that's not an issue um, that's not the point so I was behind them you see and, uh, but one old man His Holiness must have I'm sure he has abilities to see when somebody's close to death and he looked at him and he said you're not well and he said to his attendants I was right behind him he said uh, take this man to hospital and whatever the cost, I'll cover them. And uh, that man actually died that evening. So His Holiness was obviously able to see that, that consciousness was about to leave. And, uh, but see that old man was so important to him, also see the power of determination, so important to him to see his guru traveling all the way from Tibet that he would not die until he'd done it. And then as soon as he received His Holiness blessing, he died that evening. So very inspiring. Now I was behind and His Holiness by this stage was, he had to go. And so I had my relics and I had another gift and I was concentrating my mind just with appreciation and I thought I really, really respect your example, your service to humanity. And so I looked up and I could see His Holiness face but there were these silver and gold light rays shining out in all directions, incredibly bright. I'm like, wow. And I took the next step, and then it was his normal form. And I gave him these relics, and he said, thank you. <laughs> and then he gave me back the white scarf, and then he went. And uh, I was talking with Tanajan Nan about that. And he said, the silver was the sila barami. The gold is the metta and compassion barami. And uh, he said that he has that emanating from his body all the time. 
And he said, because you had faith, because he didn't have time to talk to you, he probably used his abilities to help you to see that as his way of acknowledging his gratitude and his appreciation. And uh, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So when, you, when the faith faculty is uh, ripe or powerful, then these, these beings... Remember we were reading that talk, Ajahn Anand said it was because of these special abilities of his teacher that he had some kind of vision about body contemplation and his, and, and his mind became very peaceful and then he knew it was a correct practice. And uh, Ajahn Chah had told him he needed to do body contemplation, but he, he had resistance to it. And so one day he had this vision, and his mind became very peaceful, and then, no, I do need to have this practice. And then he said, it was because of the special abilities of my teacher that I had that vision. So Ajahn Chah has used his, his insight, his understanding about the nature of the body, sent it into his disciple for long enough for them to get to get it, oh, this is valid, this will be useful. So I, I think His Holiness did something like that, just increased my sensitivity and ability for that, those moments, so that I can see, so it was a very nice thing to observe. And, uh, thinking, talking about Davis, when I was, uh, this is the last story. <laughs> When I was staying with Ajahn Anand another time, he had built his Upasada hall, which is where the monks chant the Padimokha, and there's this tradition in northeast Thailand, if you build an Upasada hall, it's so much good karma, it makes so much merit, that there's a chance that some of your bad karma might, might ripen. It's, I don't know why they believe that, but they believe it. Or it might be that your karmic debtors want to take revenge because they're upset that you made so much merit. So they come to make some obstructions, but there's a, a folk belief that if you build that building, you should spend the rainy season retreat in another monastery the year after that. So Arjuna Nun spent that rainy season retreat in the nearby branch monastery with his, uh, one of his foremost students, Tanajan Tong, and I was fortunate, he invited me to stay with him. And Arjuna Tong was preparing to build his Uposada Hall. And so they were, they were digging the ground and they chopped down a bunch of trees and they were bringing in fill to fill in the space. One night after the, I didn't see this, but the other monks did, but one night after the evening chanting, I think I stayed in, I was actually meditating, and I, but a couple of monks walked out of the hall and they saw this beautiful green light hovering in the air. A very, very bright, very, very beautiful green color and Ajahn Tong saw it as well. And uh, just as we've been reading in the life story of the Buddha, that Saka, the king of gods, would come and talk to the Buddha, praise the Buddha, etc. So, that was apparently Indra's jewel, because Indra's believed to have a green body, and it was Indra's jewel, and he was saying, this is the right spot for the hall. And so, the next day, they completely scrapped, even though they chopped down the trees and brought the field and, and uh, been noisy, I was a little bit disappointed because I was thinking, oh great, I get to go and practice special meditation with my teacher in a quiet monastery and it was trucks arriving all day. And uh, it's a large part of forest monastery practice in modern Thailand, practicing with building noise. And so, yeah, so they built the hall in a completely different place because that's where Indra said it should be. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and, uh, Ajahn Pabri says, I should tell you about the porpoise, the dolphin. In the first period of time when I was with uh, Ajahn on my second rainy season retreat, he asked me to join him on a, a Tudong trip, a trip into a, onto an island, Koh Chang. In those days, uh, nearly 20 years ago, Ko Chang wasn't very developed and he had a student who had some land on the side of the, of the island which had no roads, no buildings, it's jungle, and it had a crystal clear stream. And so I was there, I think it was with four or five other monks, Ajahn and Nun were there as well, we were staying in our umbrella, you see the monks have these umbrellas and they put their mosquito nets over it, so we were staying in these. 
think, I can't remember how many nights, four or five. And uh, this dolphin would come around in this island in the Gulf of Thailand. This dolphin would come around. And I noticed it came around the next day as well. And then the next day. And I think one day it came twice. And uh, I asked Ajahn Anand, and I said, uh, what's going on with this dolphin? And he said, the dolphin was human in a past life, but it broke some precepts. And he really liked swimming. And so a combination of merit and karma that he had to be a dolphin. He said, but next lifetime he'll be human again. He's just working through this karma. And he said, he can feel the metta of the monks and he likes it. So he's coming around to feel metta. And, uh, I tell him about the cloud or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I didn't know what would approve of me telling the story. That's why I'm slightly reluctant, but don't tell him I told you. <laughs> so it was the last night it was the last night, and the monks had actually made a, a kind of a stage-like thing that the monks could sit on. That at high tide, the sea was around us, but we could sit on this using rocks from the stream and from the, from the beach, made a rock wall and filled it in and made it flat. And so I was sitting on there, I believe I was massaging Tanajan's feet. It was a, one or two days after the full moon. And all of a sudden he said, look up in the sky. I looked up in the sky and where the moon was, there was one cloud in the whole sky. And the cloud was in the perfect shape of a dolphin. You could see the tail and the shape and the fin. And the moon was where the heart would be. And he said, the Western monk has many doubts. He says, the devas want to encourage him. And the devas made that cloud for you. Isn't that interesting? And there, were, there was not another, there wasn't a single other cloud in the sky. One cloud in the middle of the sky in the perfect shape of a dolphin. Now, I don't know if the deva was Ajahn Anand, or it could be a Naga. He told me that Nagas have some kind of uh, abilities to affect water element, clouds and auspicious types of rain. So, uh, with those few interesting contemplations, do our meditation. And so that brings us to the end of the talk, Uplifting True Stories of a Buddhist Monk. My intention in telling this story is uh, not to encourage people to become fascinated or obsessed about the supernatural or to stimulate doubts or anything like that. Rather, it's simply to share some personal stories as an encouragement and to uh, affirm that uh, I really think it's the case that there are very supportive beings in other realms that rejoice when human beings cultivate generosity, maintain ethical standards, and cultivate their minds through meditation, and also that uh, there are wonderful, marvelous results from cultivating the mind. I hope something that was shared was useful.